Okay, we're going to go ahead and get started here about growing grains. That's the topic for our question and answer tonight. And I have been in the fields all day today. We've been planting all kinds of awesome stuff. We've been planting tomatoes, peppers, green onions, lettuce, chard, beets. And we planted a couple of cover crops last week. For those of you who are on or saw the recording, you, I was showing you the cover crop with all the different edibles, all the vegetables. Well, we planted a whole bunch of that. I think I planted like an eighth of an acre, which isn't a lot, but we planted it by hand. So, you know, it's pretty awesome. It's fun to do that. So that was a super fun project today. Uh, just quickly, I'm gonna give you an update before we get into grains about what's going on around here. We have our students here for our 17 week course. And so that's been really fun to be able to teach people about soil health and how to grow food because we need more farmers in the world. And so that's been a good thing. But right now is our planting time. Our last frost here can be up until about the 10th of June. Although the old timers have seen frosts here every month of the year. So we do live in a harsh climate. So we've started planting. I've been watching the 10 day forecast every day and we had some 30 degree weather a couple of days ago. So yesterday and today and the day before. So for three days, we've been planting outside, all of our outside stuff. And most of it is transplants, but we have planted some seeds outside. And then tomorrow we will be planting more. Hopefully we get the rest of the planting done tomorrow. There will be a few things we plant next week. So we'll have to plant our spring gardens, our summer gardens, and our fall gardens in about a seven day window, meaning we don't really have a very good spring garden or fall garden in this climate. But uh, it's a cool climate, and so we can grow things during the summer here that a lot of people can't grow. We can grow all of the brassicas, any, any of the cool weather, <laughs> excuse me, any of the cool weather things we can grow during the summertime here. So it's pretty wonderful to be able to do that. And that's why I have such an elaborate greenhouse is so we can grow year round uh, because it's just tough to grow, uh, you know, other times of the year except the summer. We have uh, an 80 day growing season is what we, we think we have here. It's hard to tell because every year is different. But our last frost last summer here was June 12th and our first frost in the fall was later in September but the year before that our first frost was the third week of August so if we had our, our first frost and last frost of those two years combined it would have been a very short growing season but that's what we do here is we are growing seeds we are raising seeds we are doing land race breeding of seeds to be able to produce seed which will grow in a harsh climate Hopefully at some point in the future, we will have some of those seeds available for people so that we can help to have more food security for people who do grow or, or live and to have gardens and uh, farms in, in harsh climates. And growing grain is a part of that. I don't have the number on the top of my head, but I think I have about 15 varieties of grain growing this year. We are trialing those here to see how they will do. So we have three different kinds of oats, um, like eight or nine types of wheat. We are growing a triticale variety and a couple of types of barley. And um, we have um, rye. We're, we're growing one, I think two, two varieties of rye. So anyway, we have, we have quite a few different types of grain, which is fun. And, and everything that we are trialing this year are the, um, are the cereals. We have not branched out into other types of grain this year. Um, of course we grow corn. And so that could be a grain. If you dry it out, it would be considered a grain. Um, beans, if you dry them out, they're considered a grain. Anything that you dry and store that is dry and shelf stable for generations in a, in a container, then those things would be considered a grain. So 
uh, let's just jump into this um, growing grain. So I just took this screenshot a few minutes ago of Gene Logston's book. This is a good book. I have this book. It's a fun book. And he takes what a lot of times people consider a complicated thing and they make it, uh, you know, he, he simplifies it. When you, after you get done reading this bit, book, you're thinking, oh yeah, I could grow grain because he's talking about growing it in your garden, just in your house, just behind your, um, you know, just your normal garden plot. You don't have to have acres of land. You don't have to have um, hundreds of horsepower in a big giant tractor and all kinds of machines. No, traditionally grain has been raised in large fields because you can grow a lot more of it in large fields. So traditionally that's how it's been done. But there have been many people throughout the earth who have very small plots of grain and it certainly contributes to their food supply. So if you wanna take a <laughs> screenshot of this or write it down, Gene Logston's book on uh, growing grain is pretty awesome. And so I like this book, I do recommend it. And so, so that's, a, that's a fun thing that you can do. All right, let's go to the next slide here. So here's a, here's a video and I'm not gonna show you the video, but here's the YouTube link. I might need somebody smarter than me to help you get it if I think, I don't know, maybe if I put it in the in the comments, I think I can put it in there and then you'll actually have the link instead of yeah, trying to type this in. Is that what I'm supposed to do? Yeah, copy and paste it into the chat box. Okay. Make sure, sure. you the whole group, group and not just to me because that's what ended up happening last time. <laughs> yeah, I'm good at that, aren't I? Okay, so let me see. I got my chat box here. So I'm going to copy this. Oh, no, I'm not. I'm going to switch my slide. Okay, you guys can laugh. It's totally fine. I'm confident with that. It's all right. How do I copy and paste it, Zeke? It's not letting me. Um, you might have to not be in full screen and go to your editing window. I'm not um, sure. Here we go. I think I just did it. So I'm clicking to everyone. And I'm going to push a button. <laughs> I think I did it. Okay, so you guys can click on this at some point when we're done here tonight. You can watch this. It's just, I think it's a seven minute video about, uh, and it's just this guy from, I don't know where he's from. I think he's from like England or Wales or Ireland or somewhere like that. Just the way it looked and his accent. So it's a fun little video and he just has a normal garden with old fashioned ways of growing things. So he does till up the ground and he is, uh, um, you know, and we've been talking about not tilling as far as soil health. So this video is not showing soil health, anything like that. But it is, uh, the reason I'm recommending this video is it just shows that you can grow grain in a normal garden. So he shows how he prepares the ground, which is with tillage. In fact, he does a lot of tillage. And then he is just making furrows in the ground, which is another tillage pass. And then he's planting it. And he kind of shows you an easy old fashioned way of measuring how much grain he's putting in. And he's planting a lot more grain than I plant, but he does get a good stand and a good harvest. And so it's just fun because he shows every stage and then he shows how to harvest it. He shows an old fashioned way of harvesting it. And then he shows how to do it with a weed whacker uh, just a modern weed trimmer, you know, and then he uh, shows how he thrashes it and winnows it. And so it's fun. And there, if you go to this video, it actually has a second video too. And then he makes a loaf of bread or, or not a loaf, but like, like rolls on a, on a pan, same thing though. So it's fun. Uh, so I just thought I'd put that in there because sometimes people really get overwhelmed about growing grain. You don't have to be overwhelmed about it. Growing grain is something that people have been doing for we don't even know how long. You know, for, from an anthropologist's point of view, people say that we've been growing grain for 10,000 years or longer. 
And the more we learn, the more that number changes and it goes back in time even further. So it's interesting, you know, they didn't have fossil fuels. They didn't have giant tractors. They didn't have all that stuff. What they had are small plots. So you can certainly do it. This video shows you how he does it. Um, if you're on my Patreon, um, I have sh uh, there's videos on there about how I have planted grain um, this spring when I was putting my trials in. I don't I didn't video all of those, but I videoed some of that. Um, but let me just let's just go to the right side of the screen here. When you plant the cereals really thick, the each stalk of grain, each seed will produce about one, two, or three heads, not very many. But if you plant it thinner, meaning you space the kernels farther apart, they can grow quite a few. Sometimes they'll grow 10 or 15. Some of the ancient grains, the old fashioned ones, they will grow in a great big clump. They'll have 20 or 30 um, like tillers. They're called tillers, but they're branches. If, we're, if we were talking about a tree, it's branches. But when we're talking about grain, it's a tiller. So a T-I-L-L-E-R. So tillers are the little branches that come up. So from one seed, the plant will have all kinds of tillers if it has room to grow and it's not crowded by other plants. And so, but modern cereals usually produce about five heads per seed. And they usually have about 22 seeds per head. Now this is different in the different species of wheat, oats, barley, barley, triticale, okay? And of course, oats, grows completely different and it doesn't even have a head. But for wheat, you can kind of count on five heads per seed and 22 seeds uh, per head. Let's uh, go to the next slide here and, and see what this says. So just here are the steps. The steps are very, very simple. So I just put in eight steps here. You just grow your grains in the same place where you are growing your garden. If you're growing enough food to produce, like in your normal garden, if you're producing enough food to feed yourself, then maybe make your garden four times as big. And then, um, you know, like one fourth of the garden now is going to be where you're growing whatever you're growing. And then the other three fourths of it, you could be growing the cereals in. And then that would be, that's kind of a proportion. It's like a statistic, you know, a calculation that you can use to figure how much land you need. So if you are, if your garden is a hobby and it is not significantly feeding you and your diet throughout the year, then you probably um, need a lot bigger garden to make this calculation work. So again, the calculation is if you're growing, if you have a big enough garden to feed you a, a, a majority, let's say 80, 85% of your food supply, then you need to make that garden four times bigger and then you'll be able to produce enough grains to feed yourself too. And I've kind of made that up. Um, if, if you start, if you, if you grow, if you grow this out, and you find that that number is way off, let me know. But just from my experience, it feels about right. Okay, I haven't actually taken a tape measure out there and tried to figure it out, but that's about right for the cereal grains. Um, if you're trying to put in dry beans into that, they don't yield quite as much. It's less, it's less uh, bushels per land, per square foot, per acre. So you would need more land than that. Um, but grow your grains in rotation with your vegetables, meaning that where you are growing your vegetables now, next year or this fall, you could plant some vegetables in there without doing anything different to your soil. It's the same thing. So everything that I've been teaching about soil health and growing with, uh, without tilling and grow and just adding an inch of compost every year and just doubling your holes in and putting the plants in there and transplanting. It's the very same for grain, all right? So preparing the soil is the same thing. You would plant one to five seeds per dibbled hole about four inches apart. Now, if you happened to get a really fancy grain, let's say you got a seed packet that had 50 kernels of grain in it, 
but it was really great grain. If you just took that handful and threw it down like old fashioned sowing of, of the cereals, that's not a good way to do it. You need to just plant one seed into each hole about four inches apart and just plant it on a grid, like, you know, just a grid work, like a chessboard. So four inches apart, you put one seed in, those little pieces of grass will begin to grow and they will turn into grain pretty quick. So you want to harvest the, uh, the shocks of grain, the, the sheaves of grain, when, when these are, you know, when, if you bite one of the kernels and it it's in the milk stage, so if you see white milk coming out, it is not ready, do not harvest. The kernels need to be hard, but there will be a little green still in the stalks of the plant. Most of the leaves will be beginning to dry down, so they will be turning yellow, but there will still be green. If you wait a few more weeks and the, the, uh, the stalks are completely dry, what's going to happen is when you go to harvest it, a lot of the seeds will start falling out of the heads. And so you will be losing those during the harvesting process. So there's a perfect time to harvest. So you want to tie them in a bundle and you stack those sheaves in the field if you live in a non, like a non rainy environment. And then you let them sit there for a couple of weeks until they dry out and all of the greenness from those stalks has gone away. There might, they, the green color may still be there, but the wetness has gone. So they're really, really dry. And at that point is when you thrash it. And you can thrash it by hand super easy just by getting a five gallon bucket. Then you put, cut a bunch of those um, seed heads off and you put them in the five gallon bucket. So maybe the five gallon bucket is a third full. And then you have a cordless drill and you just um, you rig up a shaft that will hook into the cordless drill. And then on the end of it, you weld a little piece of chain about uh, three or four inches long on both sides of the, of the shaft, put it in that bucket and you turn that on and it will thrash that grain for you. It will bust the grains out of the seed head. So that's a super easy five gallon bucket thrasher that you can make yourself. And if you don't have a welder, somebody does. There's some weirdo like me who has a big shop and he's proud of his tools. He would love to build you that. So once you do that, then you take the straw, the, the, all the seed heads and, and whatever is in there, and it just comes right out. You just grab it and you pull it out with your hand. And then you can dump what grain is in the bottom in front of a fan, and the fan will blow away all the chaff, and the heavy grains will flow down onto the, into a pan below. I think I made a Patreon video of doing this last fall. Um, it could have been for something like, uh, like, um, not the cereals. It was probably peas or beans or something like that, dried beans. And then once you have your grain cleaned, you need to make sure it's nice and dry before you store it. If you store it in an, in an airtight container, like a five gallon bucket and your moisture level is too high, um, it will rot. So make sure it's super dry before you put it in a bucket. So that's it. I mean, it can sound complicated. It sounds like a lot of work for people, but it's actually a pretty wholesome, happy thing to do, you know, and it can certainly be done. It's not that hard to do. It's easy to grow the plants. The plants grow great because they want to grow. They're trying to grow. They're doing their best to like thrive and grow. Some plants, it's hard to grow them, but the cereals, grow really good but there's a couple of technical things here on the right side of this slide so you will hear of a winter wheat or spring wheat or winter um, barley or spring barley you very seldom hear of winter oats because oats are traditionally grown only in the spring so what does that mean if it's a spring wheat you plant it in the spring but that means super early. It still feels like winter, but as soon as the snow has melted, plant it. Um, 
if it's a uh, winter wheat, you plant it in the fall before the rains and snows come in the fall. Uh, so you would plant it kind of late in the fall, say October, um, September, October in most of North America. So spring, if it's a spring cereal, then you plant it in the spring. If it's a winter, you plant it in the fall, okay? And then it grows through the winter. And so that's why they call it winter wheat. So what about naked varieties? Um, when you grow wheat and rye and triticale, it automatically, when you thrash them, the, the wheat, rye, and triticale will fall out of its hull. It just, the hull is on there very loose and it just falls right out. But many, many varieties of oats and barley have a very tight hull that is around the kernel. So if you've ever fed oats to a horse, you, <coughs> excuse me, you will see that the, the oats themselves, if you try to eat one, it, it's like eating a mouthful of straw. It's not good to eat because your mouth is full of sharp, fibrous, pointy things that are poking you in the mouth. So you need to find human edible oats and barley, and they are called naked. So naked oats and naked barley are the varieties you want to grow for human consumption. And this, I've, I don't know many gardeners who know that. Usually they say, well, you can't raise oats on your own because if you raise your own oats, you can't get the holes off and they're not palatable. You, you, there's no way to separate them. They have to go through all kinds of processing in a factory for that to happen. Well, that simply isn't true. You just have to get the right variety. But I've hardly have met anybody who knows that. There's just a few people around, like one out of every 500 people know about that. So I'm telling you now, if you want human oats and barley, then you need to get the naked varieties. And yes, they're available. You just have to go to the seed catalogs and start looking for them. Just go to the internet and Google naked oats. You might want to be careful <laughs> typing the word naked <laughs> into your uh, Google. But that's what they're called. So, you know, maybe put a lot of other stuff in your search, like, um, like, human edible naked oats i don't know it's a weird world we live in if something inappropriate comes up when you type it in get better filters on your computer i don't know what to tell you about that but that's what they're called and that's what you have to uh that's what you have to grow um, for the oats and barley so i have two different varieties of naked oats i'm growing this year and i have two or three varieties of um the naked barley that i'm growing so it's super exciting um, let's see what our next one is here. So I did this figure. One of my early classes, I had a slide that talked about what to grow in times of uh, famine or food shortages. And this uh, slide was on there, although I've added to this slide a little bit. Uh, so how much can you produce in a home garden? And so I have this uh, big old math calculation here. But what this is telling you, I'll simplify this. What this is telling you, I'll just bring my... Um, I'm gonna, I'm gonna do this so you can, and then I'm gonna, so here's my cursor, you can see this now. So this 40 feet by 50 feet right here, um, this is just a garden plot, okay? So this is 1 20th of an acre. A lot of people's gardens are 40 feet by 50 feet. That's a normal size for a garden, unless you're one or two or three people and you have just a tiny micro garden and that's fine. Whatever you choose is fine, but a 40 by 50 is a normal sized garden. On that garden, you can produce um, what can you produce? Of the cereals, you can produce 150 pounds. So 150 pounds is, um, is, it's pretty good, you know, for a garden plot, that's pretty good. So that's three 50 pound bags of um, grain, which is approximately three, just a little bit under three bushels. And so I put this over here, um, you can get 30 loaves of bread per bushel. So 30 loaves of bread per bushel is pretty awesome because you can produce three bushels. So what is three times, uh, 
think it's three times 30. So 90, uh, 90 loaves of bread from a garden plot. I mean, how many loaves of bread do you eat? So if you're feeding a family of 10, you obviously need a, a, a field, not a, not a garden plot. But let's say you were one, <laughs> excuse me, let's say you're one person. Um, I mean, how many loaves of bread do you eat in a year? 90 loaves of bread, you know, if a loaf of bread lasts you a week, well, there's only 52 weeks in a year. So 90 loaves of bread, you might be well fed with that, with a, a 40 by 50 plot of, you know, wheat or oats or barley. The cool thing about wheat, a lot of wheat's getting a bad rap nowadays, but wheat is not the same as it used to be. Wheat is uh, like the DNA. I don't even know how to say this. It's it's not like wheat, the modern wheats are bad. It's just that the chroma, there's more chromosomes in the wheat nowadays than there used to be in the ancient wheats. So some of the wheat allergies that are, people are having nowadays, I think it's because of a high consumption of one, too much wheat and the varieties that our bodies are not really accustomed to. So, you know, uh, I'm not a nutritionist. I don't even know if what I'm saying is true, but it is very interesting. And it would be interesting for somebody 10 times smarter than me to do the research and find out if the ancient wheats like the Kamuts, which were the ancient wheat found in, uh, in where was it? I think it was Egypt. And then like, there's, there's a whole bunch of them. But when you do the, the DNA test, they have different numbers of chromosomes. And it seems like that could certainly impact the digestion of wheat, because those old ancient wheats have had a different number of chromosomes than the than the new ones, which is uh, which is pretty crazy. So I think it would have an impact on our on our digestion for good or ill. I don't know, but that'd be an interesting thing to find out. And I'm sure there's books written all about that already. I just haven't read those ones. So so that is uh, that is that is fun stuff. Let's see. Let's see. I think that's my last slide. Look at that. It is my last slide because there's my next slide. Okay, let's open this up to questions and answers. We can talk about this more. If you have more questions about growing wheat or oats or barley or triticale or how to safely search for naked oats on the internet, which could be a problem, especially if there's kids around, you know. So let's open this up for Q&A. Let me open my chat box so I can see what's going on around here. Um, Ezekiel, do you want to start reading here? And read me the totally question. Can. Um, my connection's not terribly great today. So my, uh, my, I might not be the best to do it. But the first question is, do you transplant spring wheat in the spring or do you plant from seed in the spring? Okay, so you can do both. Transplanting grain is a thing that really has never been done because in the early days, let's talk about a thousand years ago or even more, how were people going to transplant anything? Transplant is a new invention of our modern age, meaning the last few hundred years. So when... But I transplanted um, wheat, oats, barley, barley, triticale, and a bunch of varieties of all those this year. And they are growing very good. Some of them are, you know, a couple of feet tall. They're beginning to head out. They don't look like they were hurt by being transplanted. So the answer is no, you don't transplant any of these things. You just direct seed them. But... It appears that the ones I've tested are doing fine. So I will keep you updated over the next few years about that. Okay. I will read this next question since Ezekiel may not have a good connection tonight. Uh, would like to collect seeds. How much more... Um, needing to grow for that let me let me think about that so like an acre like one acre I think oh I wish I 
Let me go back to my slides really quick here. Let me click through these because that, okay, so look at this right here. It says five seed, five heads per seed, 22 seeds per head. If you went by this figure here, you could do a math calculation and figure it out. Especially if you, um, especially if you were like dibbling into a garden plot and you knew how many holes you were gonna have, like you could figure that out, you know, pretty easy just by doing math. If your garden is 10 feet wide and you're putting up four inches apart and, you're, and it was 50 feet long, then you could easily and quickly figure out how many holes you would have to put a seed in if your spacing for every hole was four inches apart. And then you could figure that out. But you know, but with the multiple seed heads that are growing, you can uh, you can produce, you know, uh, it's like ten times. You're producing anywhere from ten to a hundred times. And I know that's a big difference, but there's a lot of variables when it comes to farming here. So, you know, 10 to 100 times, a, a lot of times if your plants are doing good, one kernel will produce you 100 kernels of, 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 of seeds. So, you know, so that works out pretty good. Um, so Ashley typed in here, how much land would you need to provide wheat for a family of eight for a year? Obviously, that depends on how much you eat and how many loaves of bread you need. If, but let's just say that um, if you're producing, if you can figure on 30 bushels of, corn, of wheat, of any of the cereals will produce you, let's say 30 bushels, and that's a low number, you should be getting more like 50 bushels. That would be a lot better yield on your land. But 30 bushels per acre, and so a bushel is 60 pounds, okay? So 30 times 60, and then that gives you how many pounds. So a five-gallon bucket is just a little bit smaller than, uh, than a bushel, Okay, so a bushel is a little bit more than a five gallon bucket. And I'm saying five gallon bucket because a lot of people deal with with grain and wheat, you know, oats, you buy it in a five gallon bucket or you store it in a five gallon bucket for food storage. So that's, uh, so that makes sense. Leslie, go ahead and uh, ask me your question. Okay. Um <laughs> I you said you lay them out to, to in the field to dry or in your garden right uh -huh. okay so I'm thinking rodents aren't they going to come and eat it <laughs> yeah they can now you don't want to lay them down flat what you want to do is you're going to cut these off on the stalk the stalk's going to say let's say be three feet tall so you're going to cut down all those stalks and you'll make a little bundle. You'll make a bundle that's about eight inches around and you tie a string around that shock. And so that little sheave is about three feet tall. And, okay. and then you just stack about 10 of them together, you know, and you make a little, it, it looks like a, a, an old fashioned painting where all these little sheaves are stacked out in the field. So that's what you do. You so stack so them up and, and then they dry in the sun for a week or two. Okay. But right. I mean, yes, I mean, birds are going to attack it. Mice are going to attack it. Voles are going to attack it. There's going to be all kinds of things that eat up this crop. That's the Georgic tradition. <laughs> That's just the way it is. That's the reality of life. That's why there's things like scarecrows and firearms and 16 year olds who stay up all night with their 22 to shoot things so that's the that is the georgic tradition how much did you say you lose then if you're planning x amount how you know like what percentage you really think you're gonna end up with you'll end up with 95 percent if you take care of it and you watch it i mean i've known farmers who it was all drying out there because the amish still do it this way and at least the Amish that I was neighbors with in Missouri when I lived there for a decade, they still grow their grain the old fashioned way. They stack it in the fields to dry. <laughs> and when it's out there drying, big thunderstorm will come through and get it all wet. 
right at the wrong time so that all the little kernels of grain begin to grow. It's awful, you know. So, okay. yeah. yeah. Thank goodness for modern inventions, right? Thank right you. So we can just buy some wheat. <laughs> Thanks. Okay. All right. Uh, John's wondering if we can use wheat from food storage. Yes, you can. I have grown wheat from a food storage bucket. I've also grown, tried to grow wheat from a food storage bucket and the germ was dead, meaning they would not sprout. It wouldn't grow. So what I would do instead of going out and planting it, get yourself a hundred seeds out of it, put it in a paper towel that's wet on a plate and let it sit there for 10 days and, and then count how many of them sprout. And then you can just uh, get your, uh, figure out your seed germination rate from that. So if 80 of them sprout, you have 80% germination. If two of them sprout, you have 2% germination. If 95% sprout, you have 95% germination. That's why you count out 100 seeds to start with, because then you don't have to think about the math. You can just do it. Um, usually, if the food storage buckets uh, or, or packets, whatever they're in, if they have those little things in them that um, take the oxygen out, it's supposed to kill the bugs or whatever because there's no oxygen in there. It's an oxygen absorption thing. Those have been the containers of, um, of grain that I have had trouble sprouting. So I don't know if those actually stop it from sprouting. If they do something that kills the germ, I don't know. But that has been my experience. And I haven't tested it very extensively. I've tried it three times. And the three times that they had those packets in it, and they were packed in a, in a, a number 10 steel can, and those little oxygen absorbers were in there, the grains would not sprout. So I don't know what that means. It may have had nothing to do with the oxygen absorber. So you would just have to open your food storage container and see if it sprouts. That's, uh, that's all I can tell you there. Okay, do we have any other questions tonight? I think I got all the ones that were in the chat. I'll just scroll up here and look and see again. I should give Ashley a little bit better answer. A family of eight, you probably want a couple of acres with different kinds of grain. And then you'd have a lot. Is there anything that is healthier than organic? There's a lot of things healthier than organic. Um, yeah, I don't know what it is, but organic is not that healthy. Organic used to be the best. Organic used to be the highest standard in the world. But then in the 80s and 90s, in the 80s, they started this conversation of if it's going to be labeled organic, we have to control what the label says or else people don't know what they're getting because we have a thousand producers and they all say organic, but there's a thousand different standards. So I can understand the standardization that they wanted to do, but your very best producers out there, when they, when the USDA, uh, when they took over and, and made it law that here is the set rule to standardize what organic means, then your your best producers they just they just said okay well we're not going to play that game so we won't call ourselves organic anymore i don't know any really great farmer who went ahead and got the certification after that point they just went along doing their thing and but who did get into it it was the big corporations once that happened the huge mega corporations around the country, they said, oh my goodness, look at this thing. We can now charge twice as much money if we call ourselves organic. So we will do whatever it takes to become organic certified. And then, and, and the, not only the producers of food did that, but also the producers of products did that. So now you have the chemical companies and they started creating 
all of the farm chemicals, the herbicides, the pesticides, all of the machinery, um, the fertilizers, all of the stuff so that people could now meet the government regulation to be organic. And so it totally ruined what organic used to mean. If you go find the books from the 60s and the 70s and the 80s that were published by Rodale Press and they're talking about organic, it was a beautiful thing. It was wonderful. And I think everything, it's always a problem to say 100%, but I believe that everything they published was right and accurate. Um, once the, the, the official government regulation of organic came along, organic now has a brand new definition in history. It means something totally different. What it means, I'll, I'll give you a quote from the CEO of Walmart. He said at that point in history, he said, well, if organic is what the consumer wants, then that's what we will give them. And that was the, that was the mindset of American agriculture at the time. We can get a lot more money, so it's worth it to do this, but your greatest farmers who had the healthiest products in the world, they just stopped calling themselves organic and they called themselves something else, like we're just a local farm. And they already had their customers and the customers knew them and it was pointless to pay the money to get the organic certification. And so organic totally changed. So am I an organic farmer? No, I'm not. So, so what can you do when you go to the store to purchase food? What do you purchase that is better than organic? I don't really know. There are quite a few farms that are trying to come up with something else. Uh, and there's a huge argument of do we call ourselves a certain thing? And since most of these people have um, such a, a frustration because of what the United States Department of Agriculture did with the organic labeling, there has, most of them are saying, no, we don't want any of that. We don't want any of those labels. We don't want any of that stuff. We're just gonna be entrepreneurs and we're just gonna sell to our local people. And we're just gonna do our farmer's markets. We're just gonna have our stand at our farm. We're just gonna sell into our co-op we were selling into before. And we're just gonna have to re-educate the customers. So this was kind of where it has gone. So is there anything healthier than organic? Yeah, go find a local farmer and you understand his practices and yes, but to make it easy for a consumer? No, it's not easy for a consumer. Um, it has made it very hard. Okay, so next question. Is it possible to go back to the healthier way or is organic the new norm? Organic is a fad that will soon die. That's what I believe. The label may stay for a long time, but it's, it's just, it's a mess because when people get to the point where they are finding that they're eating organic grapes, if they do some research and they figure out that they're labeled USDA certified organic grapes and you're buying them in January, there's nowhere in the US that has grapes in January, maybe some places in Florida, I don't know but they're importing them from South America. There is no regulation on how they're grown in South America. When they get to the packing house, wherever in California or wherever the port is that they come to, the packing house is certified organic. And so they can put their label on it. It's a mess, it's a lie, it's awful, it's disgusting. Does that always happen? No, it doesn't. But it happens enough that I have absolutely no faith in organic. And I, I hate to be negative about this, but this is where we have come in our food growing problems of the world. So it, it's a sad thing. So I don't know, that didn't answer your question though. Is it possible to go back to the healthier way? I, I mean, yeah, I mean, that's why you're on this class, grow your own food. That's what I say, grow your own food. We, uh, and can everybody grow their own food? No, they can't, but everybody can, every person. How many millions of people are in this country? The last time I checked, it was 300 million, but that's been a while. 300 million people in the country. 
So how many farmers do we need to have who understand the principles that I'm teaching and I am promoting about soil health? Because if you grow food with these principles, your food will be healthier. That is the key. That is the fact. Food is healthier when it is grown in a healthy, functioning soil. And that's what we want. So if we want, excuse me, if we want to go back to super healthy food, like was grown before World War II, except now it can be even healthier because we understand what makes it healthy. Before that, we didn't know. Most of the soil health and food health that we understand, we've learned it in the last 30 years. And, and most people still haven't heard about it because it's not being promoted in mainstream uh, media or mainstream educational um, routes. Routes is a weird way to say it, but what is the word? Like um, institutions, schools, universities, they're not promoting the, uh, they're not promoting the, this new science. Um, some of them are, but it has not become popular opinion yet. It has not become, um, the demographics have not learned this. It's not part of our culture. So, so you know, anyway. But yeah, 300 million people. One farmer growing food the way I promote can feed a couple of hundred people. So how many farmers do we need? You know, do the math, figure it out. Let's start getting farmers. Every community needs a lot of farmers, okay? Every two or 300 people needs their personal farmer. Everybody has a personal lawyer. Everybody has a personal dentist. They all have a personal family doctor. Every family has an accountant. Every family has a mechanic to work on their car. Every family has a, a, a place where they go to get tires when your tires wear out. Why don't we have farmers that we can go to? Why are we getting cheated at the grocery store? Because we are. I mean, let's just say, okay, I'm gonna make a commitment in my life. This is all of us. We are all gonna make commitments in our life to eat healthier. So we are going to shop around the perimeter of the grocery store, where there's meat, milk, eggs, and produce. We will avoid all the middle aisles with packaged, processed junk food. Good luck with that. That seemed really negative, and I think it was, and I apologize for negativity. But what we need are farmers who are doing things the best way. Let me say one more positive thing about organics. This, this, this is positive. I'm not being sarcastic. Being certified organic is the first step to a hundred step staircase to get to where you need to be. But it, remember my slides from way back when, a few weeks ago, let me, let me look at, let me see if I can go up here and find a slide. Okay, in, a, in, a, in this kind of a system right here, we talked about the five spheres in the soil. I can have a certified organic go farm and all of these spheres are completely dead. They do not exist in a certified organic farm, okay? Let me go to another one. Um, okay, here's mineral cycle. I can have a certified organic farm and the mineral cycle does not function at all. 0% functioning, okay? Because I can use fertilizers. I can use organic certified fertilizers. I don't need any of this stuff to work, okay? Um, here's the energy flow. I don't need to use current energy. I can run my organic farm completely on fossil fuels. Okay, water cycle um, has nothing to do with organics. I can be totally certified organic and my water cycle does not have to work. I can just pump water and put it on my crops it, the water cycle does not have to work. And here's ecological succession. I don't even have to know this at all. In fact, most of the organic farmers I know, they don't know anything about the ecological succession. 
to run their farm. Okay, did somebody have a comment? Okay, I'm going to look for another slide here. I had some other fun slides to make my point. I think I made my point. I do have a question, William. Okay, go ahead. Uh, so the pesticide factor with organic, is that like real or is that contrived, do you think? On, on the Ask that a little bit more. What do you mean by that question? Well, I'm assuming that <laughs> they're being truthful and the, and the, the um, that they aren't using pesticides on their crops. That would be the main reason I wouldn't, that I would buy organic. Is that just fake too? Yes, it is. I have an entire list. I don't have it available right now. I would have to look it up, but there's an entire list of pesticides that are, um, that are absolutely um, certifiable and certified for for the, yeah, for an organic farm. Meaning if I have a pest in my farm, I can go buy a pesticide and I can use it on my organic farm. Because if we're gonna make, if we're gonna feed the people, if we're gonna feed the millions of people, we have to have the same tools as before. And this was the big argument when the USDA came out and said, we have to make this mean what it actually means. We have to, define what organic means because we have millions of people saying they're organic but they're all different okay and so when they said that all of the chemical yeah. companies said oh this is a great way to make money and so let's figure out how to make yeah. sprays to help all these farmers so yeah like pyrethian it's made from a flower and because you can grind up a flower and, and you get the chemicals out of the flower you can use it on there it's not made out of oil. It's not made out of um, man-made weird toxins, but it is made from the pyrethrian. But the pyrethrian is, um, it's a carcinogen. So I don't know. I hate this, I've been saying it. I'm so sorry. I apologize to everybody who ever hears this. <laughs> but I've been waiting my money then is what I'm hearing. I think so. <laughs> Dang it. All right. Thank you. <laughs> you know what's bad about this? Here's what's bad about this. People have mm -hmm. been eating healthy for a long time. And then they hear me give a speech like this. And then they can't even sleep at night because they're thinking, well, I can't eat anything. And I certainly don't want to do that to you. Let me real let me let me try to say where I'm coming from. I'm coming from a place of I do know how to grow the healthiest food in the world, and I can show you. And to be certified organic is the first step. If you can't even do that, then, then like you shouldn't even be farming. But it is the first step. It's not where you it's not where you arrive to. It's the very first step. But look at this slide right here. Let's just let's look at this. So here's things that make a functioning soil versus things that is a non-functioning soil. You don't have to understand this at all to be a certified organic farm, but you absolutely have to understand this if you're going to have the healthiest food in the world, because healthy food comes from a functioning soil, not from an organic system. Now I'm using the modern term organic system. If you were talking to me, to me in the 1980s and I said that, it would have meant a totally different thing and I would have said it completely different. Because in the 1980s, I totally believed in organic. It was the greatest thing ever. And it is exactly the same as what I teach today. It's just that now I have learned more. I've learned more how to do it practically, to make it work on big farming, like, like hundreds of acres, or in somebody's backyard. The principles are the same thing. And why aren't people doing it? And I don't have an answer to that one. But anyway. Okay. Well, don't we do, we know on the whole. Yeah, we do what we know. It's true. We do what we know. 
Thank you. You bet. Okay, here's another question. Have you grown or tried amaranth as a grain? Yes, I have, but not in my climate right now. And uh, yeah, it's good. It's good food. And it can, I think it'll grow in most of North America. It's a good one. You can grow it in your gardens. It's easy to grow. It grows like a weed because it's kind of what it is. <laughs> um, can I plant grain among my vegetables? Absolutely. You can mix grain in your vegetables. You certainly can. Uh, it's just a big tall grass. So if you grew a lot of it around a short vegetable, it would shade it. So that could be a good thing. If you were growing um, spinach on the north side of it, then it would be shading it as the weather gets warmer. And that would be a good thing to do because in the summer, the spinach needs a little shade because it gets too hot. So maybe you could lengthen your uh, weeks of having good fresh spinach to eat for three to six weeks while it's in the shade during the hot sun. So it could be a benefit that way. On the other hand, if it's shading a plant that needs tons of sun, then maybe it would be a bad thing to do. So anyway, yeah, so there you go. So this is our, uh, this is some information about uh, growing grain tonight. And I got a little bit excited about the, the organic question. You can see that that was a sore spot for me. That was painful. That changed and hurt my business at the time. I couldn't call myself organic anymore. And the people who are calling themselves organic and stepped into that and took that niche, they're the very same people who were the conventional farmers before that, using all of the, the things that we didn't want on our food. They didn't change their practices. They changed the label of the products they used. That's all they did. Are they less toxic? I don't honestly know. I would certainly hope so. But I do have a friend in California. At, uh, they're a famous farm. Their, their name is a Singing Frog Farm. You can look them up online and read about their farm. But um, I was talking to that guy, I think, two years ago. And we were having a good discussion about this. And he told me, he said that he was thinking about certifying organic. And so he used one of the... And somebody said, if you have pests, try this spray. It's totally organic. And he used the spray to kill one pest that was eating his crops. And he went out the next day to do a count because when you use uh, when you use pesticides, it's good to know if they're working. So he went out to do a count to see how many dead bugs he could find and how many live bugs he could find. And all bugs were dead. All of his beneficials were dead. He was targeting one species and he killed about 35 that he found dead. Um, all of his lace wings were dead. All of his ladybugs were dead. All of his praying mantids were dead. That organic certified pesticide that came from a plant, it's supposed to be very safe. It killed everything. Um, so there's a horror story for you. So he decided not to use any of that stuff. And he just went back to the way he was doing it before, which is the way he should have done it the whole time. So this is the end of our uh, class tonight. If anybody else has anything to say, you can go ahead and unmute. I'll, we have time for that. If you have any more questions, you can type them in. If not, I'm going to go ahead and close it down and we will see you next week. Thanks, guys. You're welcome. Okay, well, I'm going to go ahead and close so, this. Uh, oh, uh, yeah. John, go ahead. William, what are we talking about next week? Oh, so I, I can know. anticipate what you, it. What do you want to talk about next week? Bugs. Yeah, bugs would be a good thing. Bugs? Yeah. Okay. Well, you yeah. And maybe you've talked about that already, but. A little bit. Um, I have a feeling having more bugs next week. Okay, bugs. <laughs> I'm writing that down because my life is too busy to not write it down. Now, let me ask a clarifying question, John. When you say bugs, 
I'm assuming that you're talking about bad bugs in your garden. Is that well, but yeah. and and bad and beneficial. And how, both. and how do we how do we save the beneficial and, and get rid of the well? And you know, I said you said that if our soil is right, then we don't have to worry about the bugs. But, but there are such a thing as flying bugs. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Okay. okay. That'll be our subject. Thank you. Week. Okay. Sounds good. All right. Thank Thanks. You. Bye. Oh, I have a question, William. Yeah. Um, go ahead. You, do you have you had success planting grapes before? Could you talk about um, good methods for growing grapes? Um, grapes are supposed to grow in every climate in the world, although they do certainly struggle in certain places. Um, I have never really done grapes very much. Okay. I, I would probably be the wrong person to give a presentation on grapes. Okay. I don't feel like I have enough um, information to really understand what is needed. Okay, so, I, I'm more interested in how to trellis and that sort of thing. Just trellis. Uh, and I yeah. But I can find. We'll look online. Oh, and have you ever heard of a honeyberry bush? Yeah, yeah, I've eaten honeyberries. They're really good. Yeah. Okay. We just got some. Yeah, they should grow there. You're in northern Utah, right? Yeah, we are. The um, grower here said they don't like blueberries because the soil here, I guess, is not acidic enough, but I don't see why you can't augment that, you know. But anyway, they they don't like to... They don't like to sell blueberries, but she mentioned honeyberries. And so I got four of them. Yeah, they're a good berry. Yeah, you'll be happy. Never heard before. Okay. Thank you. You bet. Okay, there's, there's a couple of other questions here in the chat box. Oh. Um, would bees be good? Would I don't know what this means, Ashley. I don't know what a robot bee is. Would robot bees be good? idea in the future it's a robot bee. I'm, I'm guessing it's a typo but maybe you can clarify i do actually raise bees on my farm i have four beehives and but i my really bees. love them say that again they're my bees i'm very proud of them <laughs> oh. <laughs> yeah, the bees I have here, they are the Ezekiel's bees. Ezekiel, you better get up here and work your bees. <laughs> yeah, bees are great. Bees are awesome. Bees are good. Everybody should have bees, but if you get bees, you need to be educated enough to take care of them because it'd be better to not have them than to have them and not be able to take care of them. Bees need maintenance and, uh, so yeah, bees are pretty great. So uh, a beehive will, sh uh, just an average beehive should produce five gallons of honey a year, assuming you have a lot of flowers. So you need to be in a place where there's lots of flowers, but in a season you should get five gallons of honey. Um, the <laughs> highest producing hive I ever had was um, 15 gallons of honey a year. It produced um, three five gallon buckets. Wow. So that's pretty awesome. Where did you live? So that was uh, that was in Missouri, Missouri. actually. We had uh, oh, yeah. long growing season and lots of flowers. We had alfalfa fields that are so so that worked out good. Okay, uh, I'm gonna go ahead and close this down. Next week we're gonna be talking about bugs. We're gonna talk about insects, um, the beneficials and the the bad guys, and what to do about both of them. Okay, thank you very much and have a great night.